Yeah, we're live. Good evening. Good evening. Hey, we're back. Oh, what do you know? This is History Unsettled. All right, so we're working on a few bugs. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is Dr. Misha Griffith, also known as the smart one. And this is Jerry Griffith, known as the talented one. All right. We're here tonight to talk to you about Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall is something which actually I've heard that some people aren't that familiar with, but Tammany Hall was a club, a political organization mm -hmm. that was pretty much the powerhouse behind New York City for 85 to 100 years. Yeah. I, I you know, I mean, I mean, I remember it in fifth grade. I remember it in high school civics, but I remember it as cartoons, <laughs> editorial cartoons with tigers and fat guys, and I had no idea what was going on. So tonight we're going to dive in to see what's going on. Now, we have produced a little intro video, so this is the piece. The New York Society of St. Tammany, or the Columbian Order, was originally one of several men's clubs named after Tamanend, a prominent Native American chief who enabled the founding of Pennsylvania by William Penn. Wait a minute, wasn't that the guy on the front of the oatmeal box? Yeah, that, that guy. Okay. Throughout their history, Tammany used Native American terms and symbols. But the New York Society of St. Tammany, or the Columbian Order, took a long time to say, and so the organization was known for its meeting place, Tammany Hall. They could have just called it Frank's Wines and Liquors. And that would have worked too. Yeah, that would have worked. By 1800, the club had taken a decidedly political turn, in part through the leadership of prominent New York attorney Aaron Burr. The society opposed the corruption of New York Governor George Clinton, who they said was making appointments only to his family and friends. So the efforts of Tammany leadership tipped the balance of the election of 1800, which made Aaron Burr the vice president. However, there was some incident over in New Jersey that resulted in Aaron Burr losing some of his popularity. Oops. Now, we could play a little music about this, but I think that'd be a guaranteed copyright strike. You bet. President Jefferson met with Governor Clinton for advice on whom to appoint to important positions. Clinton recommended George Clinton to be named the next vice president and replace Aaron Burr. Shock. Uh, what on earth does that have to do with the corruption of Tammany Hall? Well, nothing, but I thought it was really interesting. Over the following decades, Tammany's importance rose and fell with the changing political situations. It was an organization for working men, which often was at odds with the Whig Party and later the Republican Party, both of which felt that the society would work better with lower taxes on the rich, tariffs on imports, and by limiting the political influence of the poor and immigrants. Now, wait a minute, what year are we talking about here? Uh, 1830s, 1840s, give or take. Oh, because it sounds a lot like 2019. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in the 1840s, a massive famine in Ireland and a heartless response by the British government led to massive quantities of poor immigrants looking for a job and a chance at a better life. But the New York establishment, aided by the media, argued that America should be reserved for the Americans already here. We are still talking about history. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I wasn't sure. <laughs> the immigrants were harassed, beaten, and denied even the most basic of opportunities. They needed a voice, and Tammany Hall needed the votes. In the mid-19th century, New York, which meant Manhattan back then, was administered by a group of aldermen who were each responsible for an individual ward. The aldermen had the power to appoint almost every public employee in that district, including firemen, policemen, even school teachers. Now this meant that when Tammany controlled the city, they could provide jobs to the poor immigrants who had voted for them. Even if they weren't qualified? Previous administrations had given appointments only to their friends, which had effectively excluded immigrants. Tammany just made some new friends. And made money at it. Oh yes, they made a lot of money at it. Low-level jobs were given in return for helping with an election campaign. Better paying jobs often were sold to the highest bidder. Uh, the dominant newspapers of the day, particularly Harper's and the New York Times, ran powerful exposés in which they revealed the extent of the corruption and abuse by the Tammany leadership. But these articles were often simply bigoted attacks which claimed that Irish and especially Catholics were inherently lazy, corrupt, and amoral. Our modern image of Tammany Hall is strongly shaped by the perspective of Protestant reformers such as cartoonist Thomas Nast, Theodore Roosevelt, and Fiorello LaGuardia. The question for us is, 
Tammany Hall. Working class champions. Or world class corruption. All right. So now you understand everything there is to know about Tammany Hall. Oh, no, we don't. We know that they were deep, compassionate people who only cared about the people and protecting them from the oppression of the insensitive government. Uh, we also know that they were a bunch of drunk Irishmen. No, 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 no. Let's, drunk, let's get down to business. <laughs> a drunken Irishman. Um, that's an interesting thing because the stereotype. Now, we talked about this briefly. One of the things is immigrants from America to America came from all sorts of places, all types of different social conditions. Right. But the Irish in particular, after the potato famine, mm -hmm. these were a less educated working class type. And they were... And, and it's always been, you know, a tradition here in America that the first guys off of the boat pick up, pick on the next guys off of the boat. And so, of course, we've got uh, the people who had only been here for a few years picking on the guys who are just getting off of the boat. Okay. So let's go ahead and dive into a little more history, a little more controversy, mm -hmm. and start with uh, this guy, Mr. Seward. Mr. Seward. He was governor of New York. Uh and a member of the Whig Party. Yes, we did have a Whig Party. He looks like he could use a wig. When he, <laughs> when he was being inaugurated as governor, he was trying to curry favor with some of the immigrants. And so he invited foreign-born citizens to petition the public school for public school money to support parochial schools with the idea, the stated idea, that he was hoping that these new immigrants we're going to educate themselves. Now, wait a minute. Are you saying that he wanted government money to government go support money. religious schools? Right. I have a problem with that today. It's yes. 150 years later. Yes. And New York City had uh, a uh, public school society fund, and he was encouraging the uh, Irish immigrants and the various other immigrants to go and uh, try to get funds to open up parochial schools. Now, okay, we, as we know... Now, oh, also, the population that was here, they had plenty of parochial schools, mainly Episcopalian. Actually, they were the public schools. Some of them were... One of the issues that yeah. I've read, read about here is that the public schools right. were teaching what the Catholics felt was anti-Catholic material. Yes. Propaganda, were, if you will. Propaganda, they were forcing the students to read the King James Version of the Bible. Which and isn't that course, different from Douay Reims, really. Yeah, but but, but the, actually, the other thing is, and I, you know this in your own history, we've mm -hmm. talked about this, that there are items in history where we still have what's called a very Protestant take on things. We mm -hmm. still talk about certain aspects of history, um, and really the Catholics are still, that's beyond the scope of this project. But you're going to see over and over again in the course of the evening that these little sticking points for the uh, very sober Protestant white... Sober is a key word. Yeah, sober. Uh, white Americans who are, who are already here are trying to separate themselves from the Irish, the Catholic, the Germans, the Slavs, the various other people who are coming here. But especially later. the Irish because they came in one big wave. Right. And so Governor Seward uh, makes this offer to, to the uh, various groups to go petition for the money. And of course, New York City's trustees of the public school society turns down their requests. They say, what? Yes. Now, remember Mr. Seward, and I don't know how much people know this. This is the guy that Seward Peninsula in Alaska is named after. Right. The Seward's Folly. Seward's Folly, he Secretary was of State. Later. Yeah. He was an extreme abolitionist, extreme abolitionist, passionately abolitionist, and he was during the night of Lincoln's assassination part of the conspiracy. His face he, was sliced open. Right, he, he never was, fully recovered from that. We don't talk about it because Lincoln got a little more yeah, attention. Yeah, but Seward, Seward was part was was, was knifed and was never was recovered not, completely. No. Anyway, so so okay, so Seward says we're going to send some money to New York City to fund Catholic schools. Right. Now, how exactly? Did the local people take to that? I'm sure they embraced it and said, great, free education for all. Absolutely not. The uh, trustees of the public school society turned them down. They allowed for other schools, but turned down the Catholics. And so the New York Archbishop appealed to the state of New York 
for funds, not the city of New York. This is another theme that we're going to see quite frequently he was in the this evening, is that when Tammany Hall or when the immigrants or when these political groups don't get their way with the city, they go to the state. So it's it's kind of like a broken family when, you know, mom says no, and then you go to dad, <laughs> and dad says, what did mom say? Well, let's talk about the response. One of the nifty responses, nifty, nifty is not the right yeah. word, a gentleman by the name of James Harper. 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 Prominent name? Very prominent name. Um, James Harper uh, became mayor of New York for one brief one-year term, 1844 to 1845. In that time, he established the municipal police force. Now, you see here, it says he eliminated wandering swine. In every reference I have found about James Harper's mayorship, they talk about how there were free-roaming pigs. pigs. He got rid of them, and he created the police department. That seems like an oxymoron. Anyway, shh. <laughs> it seems like anyway. a really easy joke, okay? He got rid of the That's pigs wandering really in the streets, and then he created... The police now, so police departments, as we know them, are surprisingly recent developments. Right. There wasn't really... There was a night watch before that, but before the 1840s, mm -hmm. if you had a crime committed in your house, you had to basically... Go get your neighbors, round up. My husband beat me. Well, let's go grab him. Hey, did you beat her? Why, no. Oh, okay, good night. <laughs> it was it was not the scientific and and um legal sort of pursuit that we know today. Now modern these, concept of police come out right. of London around 20 years before. Right. This is one of the, the first bodies. real police departments where they're actually on patrol, they're actually there, they're actually first responders. Before However, they were later responders, they couldn't prevent crime, they couldn't protect you, but they could hang the guy they thought was guilty. Right. They were not uniformed. They wore a big copper badge uh, shield on their coat to signify that they were policemen. And according to some stories, that's where we get the term copper. There's from. controversy over that. Yeah. Other people say it came from the word carpe, carpum. But okay, so Mr. Mr. Harper was, of course, famous because he was a publisher. He uh, started what is today Harper Collins. It was Harper and Row. They were huge. They are still huge. Their family is still dirty, stinking wealthy. Um, but he went, he at the time was putting out uh, Harper's Monthly. Actually, it, it was slightly it was, later. It was, but he was putting out various Books. magazines. One of his first big hits was a volume we're going to talk about now, which was called, uh, got it right here, called the was it the dis, dis awful disclosures of Maria Monk? I'm afraid it shows up as backwards on my screen. So the awful disclosures of Maria Monk was um, it's kind of like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion right. at the time, but this is in the early this is 1836. It was first published. Three hundred thousand copies of this tale, which involves oh, just grotesque stories. I've read through part of it. You can find it online. We'll put a link in the comments. Yeah. Sex, torture, murder. A lot of murder. One of the supposedly, things... Supposedly supposedly disclo disclosing what really happened. Pardon me. What really happens in convents. So we find out what you didn't know, which is that Catholics are evil. Yes. Nice of them to tell us. And people, 300,000 copies. So this started the real fortune of the Harper brothers. There were four. Right. James was the prominent one. He became the mayor. So this was a whole industry, you know, producing this stuff and just, I mean, the titillation factor, right. um, I've, as I say, I've read part of it. It talks about how nuns were always getting pregnant and they would wait till the child was born. Then they would baptize it yes. and then they would strangle it. Mm. I know it, it's, um, there's also, uh, I got another picture right here, which is, this is text from the volume. And there on the image on the left, you can see these are torture devices. You know, she's going through a secret passage to get to the priest's room. These are torture devices that were allegedly used. The, to be clear, the awful disclosures of Maria Monk was a work of fiction. Maria Monk was a real person. They found her. She was deranged, but she had never been in the places she described. This never happened. But this really helped fire up the anti, particularly Catholic fury. Right. And that gets into all sorts of things. We've got um, the Anti-Catholic League was going big, big time. Really started growing after this. Mm -hmm. And we get a group of political parties that we know today as a group, the know-nothings. I know nothing. Yes. You were waiting for that joke. You've been waiting Sergeant, all day for that joke. Sergeant Schultz joke. Yes. But they were various nativist 
parties, meaning that they were highly anti-immigrant. Nativist. In fact, Native American had a very different meaning back then. You bet. I'm a yeah. Native American means I was born here mm -hmm. and I can be mean to the guys who <laughs> were got here 10 years after I, right. you know. I'd, but um, they but they had basically uh, for about a decade, a decade and a half, they had political candidates. They ran them in all sorts of elections and a few were uh, a few were nominated and elected. It, they were coming to the fore at a particular time when the Whig Party was breaking apart because of the issue of abolition. Yes, which the Republicans came along with. By the way, we've got a comment in the live chat mm -hmm. from somebody referencing the film The Gangs of New York. Which we'll we'll I, get there. Well, I, I want to mention that I've read the book, The mm -hmm. Gangs of New York, the film. The overview is correct. The details are balderdash. Um, yeah. Bill the Butcher died 20 years before Boss Tweed came to power. They didn't know each other. He never right. killed anybody. Those are minor details. But the subtext and the Bowery Boys versus the Dead Rabbits. What a name. Hi, I'm a dead rabbit. Oh, good. I'm a dead rabbit, too. Um, that stuff's pretty real. And, and we'll, we'll get to those in a minute. But yes, that was part of the nativist party movement. Bill the Butcher or William Poole, uh, which was his real name, was one of the nativist candidates. He was an important figure in the in the uh, American <laughs> Party. The no, no there no nothing. But party. he was a Bowery boy. He was a thug. But he was a Bowery boy. He was a thug. He was an enforcer. Uh, he these died are, in a barroom fight. These are the Bowery boys. Actually, wore uniforms. They were amongst right. the better dressed street thugs. They wore firemen's uniforms. <coughs> Firemen were volunteers, uh, although they were uniformed, and they made money uh, by going out and fighting fires. And the Bowery Boys wore these uniforms as their gang symbol, along with stovepipe hats, those tall top hats. That was their okay. gang symbol. I just wanted to show you, this is something I found. And again, we want to do deep dive in the archive. The item on your far right there, the KN ticket, no nothing ticket, is essentially a sample ballot that was printed out. Technically, this was in Philadelphia, but it was the same movement. And on the bottom, there are instructions that says, tear off the top and bottom before you shove this in the ballot box. So nobody will know we told you who to vote for. Right. Um, so pre-printed printed ballots that they would hand out and the know-nothings could vote uh, as a body. And this is somewhat important because as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, there was other people were stuffing ballot boxes. There was other things going on before Tammany got involved. Tammany got involved. We're not going to deny that. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, right. But we did want to point out the fact that Tammany wasn't the first to bring corruption and uh, graft into the system. The system already had graft. The system of patronage. Okay. So Mr. Seward, there. back in, in uh, Albany. Right. Uh, is, is basically calling the shots, trying mm -hmm. to do things. So we get the first really prominent Tammany Hall leader to take office. This is Fernando Wood. He was the Grand Sachem. And by the way, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> that Grand Sachem meant the leader of Tammany Hall. Tammany, because as we mentioned in the intro video, was named after a Native American right. chief. Uh, they used terms. Their meeting hall was called the Wigwam. The mm -hmm. members were called warriors. And the Grand Sachem was basically the Grand Poobah. Right. But And they had funny outfits and things. Okay. So Fernando Wood was not Irish. Not Catholic. Nope. And crooked. Very. Um, he first off, he got into a lot of controversy because he supported Southern secession. This this will be another problem that we're going to see with Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall is trying to protect the rights of working men, and they felt that uh, slavery uh, that that free sl slaves, free African American slaves, was going to harm their ability to work. I'm not sure that's the entire reason. I think, honestly, a big part of it was the fact that they were Democrats and the Democratic Party was there. And just as today, you have coalitions. Right. There is no reason for a person who opposes abortion mm -hmm. to deny global warming. They're separate right. issues, but right. they're lumped together and a Republican tends to believe in both and, and vice versa. Ex exactly. So you had these things. I'm going to jump forward and show a slide. She doesn't want me to show this slide because it's ugly, but I think it does show some perspective. So okay. you've got basically on these issues, and there are exceptions to these, mm -hmm. but as you can see, um, basically 
the Whigs and later the Republicans tended to favor limited immigration. Uh, they opposed slavery passionately. Tammany, the Democrats supported them, so they supported Southern Democrats. Alcohol, you betcha. Anyway, um, business, lazy fare, you get the idea all the way down. Um, so these were grouped issues. And just as today, you've got these grouped issues with a political party. By the way, was there a tiger on that? Oh, we're getting to that, aren't we? We're getting to that, yes. Okay. So we need to find out why Fernando Wood, being as powerful as he was in Tammany Hall, is going to get into a huge amount of trouble. And that's because of his support for the municipal police, we the talked about city the police. police of New York. Okay, so the municipal police were founded in 1845. Right. Uh, Fernando Wood comes to power in about 1853, I think, 54. Mm -hmm. It was on the slide. You guys yeah. can back up. Right. Anyway, so in that little time, are you telling me that there was already corruption? There were already police officers on the take? There was already bribery? Basically, to be a police officer was an easy way to make money. As far as you're working a protection racket, it would be a shame if someone robbed the store. So if you will pay me so much a month, I'll make sure your store is safe. That was one form of graft. Um, and it got worse and better over time. So obviously Albany doesn't want this. Right. So, Misha, what does Albany do? The state capital is trying to w wipe out this corruption. The right. unsafe. So, wait a minute. We create a police force to protect us, and now they're uh, the beating us up force, and robbing us. Yeah, yeah. The police force is now corrupt. What do we do? We bring in a new police force. And this is what the governor in Albany does is that he creates a brand new police force, the Metropolitan Police Force. So now you have the Municipal Police Force and the Metropolitan Police Force. So wait, there's two force. police forces running around in New York City. Two police forces running around in New York City. What if so I get arrested by one and the other ones don't recognize it? Exactly. Or one go, they're trying to arrest each other uh, or they're trying to shake down the same... Um, <laughs> same, same, same guys, guys. because the <laughs> municipal because police were just as corrupt right. or they were well, soon so um i happen to know that one of the things that happened was the fernando wood refused to recognize any authority from right. the municipal police and the fernando wood had some police. control over the law courts so if the law courts and the district attorney are not going to uh authorize the arrest, what do you do? So the governor did the only logical thing. He sent the Metropolitan, which one's which? Metropolitan municipal, Police. Municipal, he sent the municipal police in. No, 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 Metropolitan Police. He sent the, the ones appointed by Albany right. in to arrest Fernando Wood. Yes, so arrest Fernando Wood, arrest the municipal police. And that started a riot. <laughs> yes, and so the New York police riots of 1857 become a real thing of the municipal forces versus the metropolitan police. Uh, thankfully, there wasn't a lot of gunplay. Technically, course, there were there were like 30 injuries. Nobody right. was killed. By New York standards, it was a relatively mild riot, but you had this scene on the front steps of City Hall of one group of police chasing down another group of police. You're under arrest. No, you're under arrest. No, you're under arrest. Yeah, it must have been Keystone Cops time. I wonder if that's where they got the idea. No. Okay. So anyway, so the municipal, the New York Albany appointed police, right. basically take control of The Supreme Court backs them, right? And they are never corrupt. And New York never had corrupt police officers since then to this very day. They're <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So because happen. what's going to happen is that it's clear to quite a few people in the city that law and order is starting to break down. And so about a month, month and a half after we get the um, we get the police riots, we start getting some very interesting other riots. This is like, like the two weeks rabbits. later. And the Dead right, Rabbits right. riot was a big one. There were a lot of people killed. There um, were several people killed. But it was the Dead Rabbits were the Irish street gang. I'm not quite sure why they called them the Dead Rabbits. They used it as an emblem. I know that. They, oh, they waved okay. it around. And the nativist Bowery Boys. And of course, you know, we we even uh, the the Bowery Boys were hanging around, or at least there was a uh 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 
Was, there, there was, was a, a series of bad movies in the series 50s, of bad movies, but I don't yeah. think there's any connection. No, um, I don't think so. But it was they, they was, were a gang. Bill the Bum, Bill the Butcher was a leader of the Bowery Boys. Right. He was a nativist, played by an Irishman. <laughs> but um, anyway, so that was really nasty. So we've got these clans growing. We've got basically these forces brewing against each other. You've mm -hmm. got law and order, reform, respectability, and no alcohol versus these immigrants, these drunken immigrants fighting, protect, keep New York for the New Yorkers, keep America for the Americans versus these guys who are like, well, I live here. I'm going to stay here. Yeah, Thank you very here, much. We're staying and we're not leaving. So we have to start dealing with this. But Fernando Wood in particular did reach out to the Irish community and say, you guys can come here. You can vote with us. You can vote as many times as you like. And we've Sorry. <laughs> we will incorporate you and do it. This is Harper's Magazine, and I wanted to jump into this. Harper's, which we, is we mentioned John Harper earlier. James. James Harper's Harper. is, uh, you know, this is yes, the still the magazine that's still published. It is Harper and Row and Harper and Collins, which is still printing today. Um, they, by the for the record, on their website, they really whitewash the abuses of James. These drawings are from a little later. The cartoon on the left that shows an Irishman, this is the way Thomas Nast drew Irishman, attacking Columbia, Columbia, who represents America, and she is strangling him, and the caption says, bravo, bravo. Um, this particular cartoon is the main reason why Thomas Nast got fired. From uh, Harper's Weekly. <laughs> actually, no, no, no. Oh, no, wasn't no. It's the reason why we no longer have the Thomas Nast Award for Political uh, Cartooning. Yeah. Thomas Nast Award for Political Cartooning was established in 1968. It was abolished about four months ago because somebody said, well, Thomas Nast was a racist. Um, for the record, I think that's a little easy to take. Thomas Nast was a champion of rights for Asian immigrants, Asian. for uh, emancipated slaves. Mm -hmm. He really was there. He hated Irish. <laughs> The question is, can a person still be good when they have some negative attitudes? Yeah. He was a, I think I mentioned this in the <laughs> intro video, he was a converted Catholic himself. He was right. very passionately anti-Catholic. Mm -hmm. But these images were done. And one of the things that I wanted to mention is the boss of Tammany Hall coming out a little later said, Famously, stop them damn pictures. I don't care so much what the papers say about me. My constituents don't know how to read, but they can't help seeing them damn pictures. Yeah. So cartoons, very influential in this whole discussion. And if you look very carefully at the, the nature of the magazines, the weeklies themselves, they're full of images. They're full of a lot of type. I mean, they are just dense with these stories, but a lot of images as well. Uh, and complex images, not simple drawings. These are very complex. And we'll show you some that get more and more and more complex. In fact, you can take a lot of time looking at them, reading them, trying to figure out what all the symbols meant. And this was a way for you to keep that weekly magazine uh, on your bedside, uh, in your barber shop, anywhere where people would be gathered to talk, and it was important for people to have that for an extended period. We did of time. have at this time already. We had uh, dueling media, kind of like right. today. You've got Fox News and MSNBC. You did have the Irish Times, which was a very pro-Irish newspaper. But you did have the New York Times, which is a very anti. Irish paper. They they actually the were, times. and particularly yeah. they were anti-Catholic at the right. time, but. Anti-Catholicism was very big in this country. Mm -hmm. There was um, uh, Samuel Morse, of course, the inventor of Morse code, famously organized anti-Catholic protests. Right. Oh, I also didn't mention, unfortunately, back when we were talking about our buddy James Harper. Right. One of the things that he pushed for was a law that would limit the vote to people who owned a certain amount of property. Right. The giving, giving a, 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 a making sure that not only were you uh, registered to vote, but you had to own property. And they were trying to push through rules such as you had to live in the United States for 21 years. Even though you might have been naturalized, you had to live in the United States for 21 years before you could vote. So they were trying to minimize the vote. Um, this is uh, 
Oops, that's not the one. It's nope. draft rise. I'm sorry, back. but I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back live. I was we, have show... go, we have to show them the um, the one particular um, oh, uh, the, one ad. The one ad? Yep. All right, sorry. Uh, keep them busy while I find it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, okay. No, little snippets. Uh, little... Okay, the image on the left, that's a Thomas Nat. Sorry, on the right. As a Thomas Nast cartoon, he often drew Irish people as apes or gorillas. Yeah, gorillas, dark skin, uh, heavy, heavy chin. They're always uh, holding a shillelagh, a cane with them. Um, and, of course, they're always drunk. Uh, there's always liquor involved. But one of the things uh, that we did find, uh, I don't know if, what newspaper this was from, but I believe that's in the Times. You, you just yeah. Uh, was uh, ad uh, one ad from the New York Times that says nurse wanted middle aged woman capable of taking care of two small children. She must be a good plain seamstress. No Irish need apply. Apply at eleven East Fourteenth Street between ten and eleven o'clock a.m. So yeah, no sure. Irish need apply. There was actually a uh, scholar in 2002 published a paper. And this is a side note, but it's an interesting. Hey, mm -hmm. we're, we're here to be entertaining. Yes. About a guy basically said that the reports of anti-Irish prejudice were exaggerated, that, in fact, it wasn't as severe that they were, these were caused by modern Irish Americans trying mm -hmm. to basically say, me too, my ancestors were oppressed, and so right. on. By the way, your ancestors are not you, just, just so you know. Um, <laughs> but what's interesting is there was um, a 14-year-old girl mm -hmm. named Rebecca Freed from uh, Northwest Washington, D.C., who went in, found the research. She said, this doesn't sound right. And mm -hmm. she went in and dug through old want ads, went through paper after paper, probably went to the Library of Congress because it's here in town. Right. And she basically got a scholarly article published saying, uh, no, it's real. And yeah. the consensus now among scientists is, yeah, there was very real, very severe anti-Irish prejudice, and these people desperately needed somebody to speak for them, Right, which is where our friends at Tammany Hall came in. Um, just a few more things we're going to run through. This is a rather famous picture of... Uh, those are bishops looking like crocodiles. Their hats are looking like... Yeah, this is, this is the fear that uh, Catholics could not be good Americans because they always had, um, they always uh, Obeyed Rome. owed, uh, they always allegiance, owed to allegiance to Rome and to the Pope, not to the president and the, and their fellow, um, fellow Americans. This is an image of a naturalization program organized at Tammany Hall. This is from 1856, which is surprisingly early. Um, this is also from Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, um, which was a little bit more sympathetic. By the way, if you ever look at our useless history section, I did a video on Frank Leslie. And it's, yep. I'm sorry, a little, little selfish, selfless plug there. But Frank Leslie was originally an immigrant himself when he mm -hmm. died. His wife changed her name to Frank Leslie and continued to publish the paper. It's a fun story. Yeah. Totally fun irrelevant fun to what we're yeah. talking about. But the thing is, if you go back and you look at this image we were just looking at, you can see that there's a bouncer there basically protecting people as they're registering, basically getting naturalized so that they can eventually vote. Um, what, could you uh, share with us that story about John Kelly and uh, Mike Walsh? Ah, okay. Let me get my notes. Okay. Well, she's going to, sorry, I'm going to, maybe we'll skip forward a little bit while she prepares that. Because, um, so the voice of the Irish, Tammany is stepping into this gap but Tammany has no controls. So they are running the police force, but still, who else are the Irish gonna turn to? We get into this gentleman named William Tweed. Most people have heard of Boss Tweed. Mm -hmm. uh, Boss Tweed was originally a fireman, and he was also Scottish. He was, a, actually, he was American born of Scottish right. ancestry. Um, Boss Tweed was a bully. Yes. There's no question. He was a big man. He once very said his success was because of his size. Right. He was a fireman, mm -hmm. and he was very famous for being the first to fire, right. and if he wasn't the first, beating up the other fire departments. <laughs> yes. There are <laughs> stories told, these are probably exaggerated, right. of a house is burning down, and the firemen won't put it out because they're fighting with each other over who gets to put it out. Right. Uh, but Boss Tweed, uh, his fire department had a uh, a 
uh, tiger. Tiger as, an as their emblem. And so he carried that to Tammany Hall. So this is why Tammany Hall and Tammany Tigers uh, are joined together. So you will often see the tiger became the shorthand for Tammany Hall. Right. Um, it's also why we uh, have a copy of the Jungle Book on the shelf behind us. Uh, oops, but you can't see it. We got it. We're cropped right. too tight. Hey, Bruno, can you fix that? <laughs> He's off. Man, Bruno, what are you going to do? All right. So where did we leave off? We got through. We were getting into Boss Tweed. Some people said Boss Tweed was a little tiny bit corrupt. Um, that's and not true. And other people said he was really, really, really corrupt. Um, but Tweed wanted to take control away from Albany. And he did. Mm -hmm. um, oh, did I skip past the draft rights? Yes. Oh, okay, well. <laughs> we'll get back to we'll it. Come we'll come back, back to the there. draft rights. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, once, once Boss Tweed gets a whole... Uh, bunch of his Tammany people running New York, and they're in very uh, elevated positions. Jobs like the chamber Chamberlain's office. The Chamberlain was the guy who found banks to take money, the funds that the city had taken in, in, in fees and taxes and all that. So they had to deposit it somewhere. So it was this guy's job to find banks in which to deposit it. And before Tammany had kind of taken it over, the job allowed for whoever was in the office to skim right off the top. And it was not unusual at that time that these guys were taking home $200,000 per year. In the 1860s or and more. 70s? Yes. That, yes. That's just an obscene amount of a house cost like six or seven thousand dollars. And so when Boss Tweed and his group take over New York at this moment, the Sweeney, who is the gentleman who becomes the Chamberlain, uh, changes the job so that he takes a flat salary. So they start doing some interesting reforms. But Boss Tweed has some bigger and better ideas. He will take some uh, reports say six hundred thousand. Some reports say a million dollars. A million dollars to in Albany. 1868. Right, and he will lobby for a new charter for the city of New York, uh, so that they could write their own laws uh, and appoint new their own format, their own government, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, Boss Tweed is going to be very generous with this sack of money. And he will get Albany to put forward what will become known as the Tweed Charter. And it's a reorganization of the city of New York. And what they seem to do is simplify the government in New York. There are fewer jobs uh, uh, as far as the people at the top, as far as the administration. However... What this new charter did in order to get rid of some of these jobs was to get rid of the checks and balances on the very high ups of the city. And of course, these were all Boss Tweed's people. And so the city of New York, even though they've got a new charter, even though they've got a bunch of new rules, even though they seem to be in the mood for reform, are actually becoming far more corrupt. What was at stake was not just a handful of people at the top making money. What was at stake was 12,000 jobs that had to be filled by political appointees. And that's the genius of Boss Tweed. Okay. So Boss Tweed manages to take control. Manages to take control. So now he's got control of the city government and they're going to make sure their people get elected everywhere, not just at the top, but throughout all of voting. Were there voting irregularities? There were lots and lots and lots of voting irregularities. There were plenty of people being shut out from the vote. There was threats of violence. You can see this one image of Tammany Hall representatives standing outside the polling place with a pile of rocks. Well, we just happened to be holding rocks. This sounds familiar. These, we've heard yeah. these accusations we've more recently. These, yeah. Now, the image on the left is actually a NAST cartoon, which is, um, and this is, 
not an invalid point. It is a government official telling a Native American, in the modern usage of the term, that he's not allowed to vote while an Irishman is getting to vote. Right. And the idea here is that that's outrageous. How can this Irishman vote, but you can't? Right. Well, I think they should probably both be allowed to vote. Yes. But this was part of the attacks on the Tammany Hall and the voting system. And, and if, one of the one of the other ways they uh, cheated at the ballot box was something called repeaters. In that something called repeaters. Repeat. Yeah. Repeat. Uh, Easy joke. Yeah. Basically, when African Americans would go to the polls to vote, they would find out that someone had already voted in their name. Remember, this is a time before photo ID, that sort of thing, and it was Tammany representatives who were working the polls. So these uh, these uh, Tammany representatives would be coming in very, very early in the morning, and the poll workers, Tammany poll workers, would allow them to vote. By the way, uh, I need to cut in here for a second yeah. and just point out, this is an image of, you know, he says basically vote early and often. Um, if the artwork looks familiar, that is by an artist named Theodore Geisel. Dr. Seuss. Dr. Seuss. So this is obviously not really from the period we were talking about, but I love the picture, so I wanted to show it. Yeah. The yeah. Now, there's there are all sorts of interesting stories about voting regularities as well. Uh, not that they all check out. There's one story that uh, the Tammany members would grow their beards out before election day, and then they'd vote with beards, and then they would get the beard cut off and just have the mustache and vote with just the mustache and then be clean shaven. I don't buy So it. that way they could vote I three don't buy times. It. I don't buy yeah, it because don't, it, it don't. wasn't necessary. The poll workers were right. often on the take. Right. There wasn't, um, and you're not going to fool that many people anyway. There are a couple other stories. There was one gentleman right. who bragged that he had voted 17 times. Right. And there's a wonderful story. There's a book that we're going to include in the uh, description below written by George Plunkett called Plunkett of Tammany Hall who was in the uh, very beginning of the 20th century, and he was shamelessly unapologetic. But he told the story of a poll worker who mm -hmm. greeted a man who came in and said, what's your name, son? And he said, my name is Thomas O'Malley. And the poll worker said, you're not Father O'Malley. To which the young man said, the hell I'm not. <laughs> and remember, not the when, remember when the president was complaining about Tammany Hall and he gets on the tweet and he says, you know, these Democrats could have gone in and voted and there were all of these illegal aliens coming. Oh, wait a minute. That wasn't Tammany Hall, was it? No, that wasn't Tammany Hall. That was okay. uh, last year. So one of the okay. issues we have um, with these stories, and it's a very real issue, right. is I question some of the extents of tales of voting irregularities because it wasn't necessary. Right. Because as we've said, there was nobody else speaking for these poor Irish immigrants and Jewish immigrants and uh, Slavic immigrants and German immigrants. German immigrants. There was nobody speaking for them except for Tammany Hall. And there are countless stories I find of the ward healer. So as we said, New York was divided into wards. The ward healer can get you a job. A guy gets drunk, gets in trouble. His mom goes, talks to the ward healer. The ward healer goes down and talks to the, the jail. We work something out, we take care of you. So these they were part of the community right. and they were a fixture. And I think, and and they took care of law and order in other ways too. Tammany Hall ran bail bonds, so that uh, okay. they made a huge. I want to I want to jump in here bonds. and say yeah. it seems like that's the real corruption of that may have come later. Although Tweed was plenty corrupt. Yeah, Tweed was eventually. Uh, well, we'll get there. Yeah. Shall we? Um, okay. So anyway, my my point is, I really think that there were enough people voting legitimately for them. Right. And we see when you look at the time frame, when you draw a chart, there was mm -hmm. Tammany, then a reformer, then Tammany, then a reformer. It went back and forth and back and forth. But these reformers, they weren't just saying, <clears throat> clean up the system is a nice one to have. Right. But a big part of what they're saying was clean up the system and put me in power. Right. So it, it was it was all about numbers. That's what they appreciated. Uh, and okay. that's what they worked for. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, some of the real abuses that the Irishmen that the Irish were facing. Really, I wanted in to get into I wanted to get into the story of oh, okay, corruption. <laughs> so these are also cartoons, and the one on the uh, left there, which I actually showed in the intro video, uh, that's you know 
wholesale versus retail corruption. And basically, that is a picture of Boss Tweed at the top walking out of a bank, and the police officers are saluting him. And the picture at the bottom, there's a bakery, and police officers are beating somebody up. The one on the right is fascinating because you notice that that's an African-American behind there. And so the reformers were very pointed out that Tammany police were particularly harsh on African-Americans. Particularly, and they uh, had a patina of, perform, of, of reform at times that... African-Americans did not vote regularly yeah. for Tammany. <laughs> but they would uh, absolutely crow about the fact that they shut down a store owner because the store owner had sold three cents worth of soap on a Sunday. Laws against Sunday, uh, what was it called? Sabotina sabotination. Sabotination. We're basically in part an attack on the working class. This is one right. of the things we find. Reforms, all of these neat ideas were actually in some ways attacks on the working class because office people, professionals worked five days a week. Working people worked six. six days a week. So your only day off is Sunday. Sunday. And if the stores weren't open, if the saloons weren't open, if the things you needed weren't there, you couldn't get them, then, you know, your life is a little bit more miserable. Uh, and so the, the reformers are trying to do all sorts of things to basically keep these people upset. Okay, I'm going to have to drop back, unfortunately, because it's part of our story, and we sort of skipped over this mm -hmm. issue, which is back in 1863, the draft riots. Now, a lot of there's a lot known about the draft riots. There's a lot talked about. They were in the gangs of New York. Right. Many people know that in 1863, uh, they imposed a draft, and part of the terms of the draft was that if you got a draft notice, you had to go fight for the Union, mm -hmm. unless... You could find somebody to take your place, right? Or you paid three hundred dollars, right? Now, to, most of these people did not have three hundred dollars. Could have been a million. Yeah. So they were outraged. Right. This is under the time of Fernando Wood, who we talked about before was pro-Southern. Fernando Wood had at one point said, "You know, if the South succeeds, maybe we can secede too. Right. New York will be its own country, and I'll be king." Yes. I don't think he said king, but he probably yeah, thought it. Yeah, really. So, so all of a sudden, you've got New York thinking about going the way of, of North Oops, and South I keep Carolina. Doing that. Good shot. So New York we going apologize. the same way as North Carolina. Ugh. So you had common cause between the Democrats in Tammany and the Democrats of the Southern state. Because also the, they were willing to help them, and that was the only way they won right. any elections. The image on the right, it was actually called the Brooks Brothers Riot. Yep. And it was, um, basically, that's the Brooks Brothers clothing store was broken into and torn down. Image on the left is of a lynching of an African American. It's kind of disturbing to look at, but it was a very real part of the New York draft riots, they burned mm -hmm. down an orphanage. They, African they Americans, down an African American freed orphanage. African Americans were hunted down. For some reason, there was a little logic there that says, right. "Why should I have to go to fight for you? You're competing for my jobs." Right. And they blamed the black. And it was horrible. And obviously, this led to Irish people shouldn't vote. Right. Irish people shouldn't have it because Irish people can't control themselves. Yes. That 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 this was used by the elites, the Republicans, to say, "Look." They can't control themselves, and they're uh, anti-union. They're not going to go fight for the union, and they were became under suspicion. This is a cartoon from around the time. You'll notice that's basically uh, an African American being beaten by Irishmen, and Lincoln's doing nothing about it. And you could possibly make the case that the outrage, the national outrage over the draft riots and the treatments of African Americans contributed to the decision to sign the Emancipation Proclamation, right? Um, possibly. But just to be clear, Tammany Hall officially, especially after this, mm -hmm. supported the Union. Right. There was a Tammany regiment that fought mm -hmm. at Gettysburg. There is a monument at Gettysburg with a statue of Tammany, the Native American, it says to the men of Tammany who fought, there were 120 people from the Tammany regiment who died fighting for the Union. Right. So not all Irishmen. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, but there was a reason why I wanted to do that, because we're going to talk about another riot. More riots. But first, corruption. For your entertainment. More corruption. Okay, so tell me about uh, Boss Tweed, a little more details on his corruption, would you please? Boss Tweed is going to go on a building spree. New York, of course, uh, 
is going to need bigger and better facilities as it grows. There's a huge influx of uh, immigrants coming into New York. This wasn't a slow trickle. The, the amount of immigration going into New York and America was in fact quite big. So one of the improvements that Boss Tweed is going to help put through is of course the New York City Courthouse. It was started in 1861 and it was finished in 1872 at a cost of something like $13 million. That's their money. That was twice what Seward paid for Alaska. <laughs> uh, and the some of the examples of expenses for uh, for this building was one carpenter worked for a month in a building that has suspiciously very little wood in it and made $360,000. Three tables and 40 chairs to go with it uh, were sold to the city of New York for $179,000. Two days' wages for a certain plasterer, known as the king of the plasterers, he made. He was very good. Yeah, one hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars for do, two days' work. Now, the time because it took so long to to uh, build this building because the graft was seen as being over the top. Uh, Albany insist that the New York commissioners go ahead and uh, investigate this building and how much it cost and where all the money went. And the group got together, they investigated, they uh, wrote a big report and Boss Tweed was the guy who printed up the report. He owned a, he owned a printing shop, <laughs> he had a printing shop and he made a couple of copies of this report and made like $7,000. So to print the report? Yes, so he's making money off of printing the report, telling everybody how corrupt his government was. <laughs> okay, so Boss Tweed was unstoppable. He controlled yes. the police, he controlled the courts. He had paid $600,000 right. to stop Albany from overtaking and he worked. He actually was elected as an assemblyman to the state assembly, had to go to Albany, got the laws changed so that New York had more autonomy. He was unstoppable, right. he was making a fortune. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Except something's gonna go very, very wrong. And those are the orange riots. Riots, plural. Riots, plural. So what exactly is Orange Day? Do you know? Orange Day was a celebration uh, basically by the Protestant Irish, the Northern Irishmen uh, nor from North Ireland celebrating. I I, actually, at that time, holiday, I believe at that yeah. time that the Protestants were not quite isolated entirely in the North. Right. Don't, don't, you can, you can check. I'm not sure. Okay. So the Orange Day was right. June, uh, June 12th. July 12th? Something like June that. June 12th, yeah. every year. June 12th. Is the day when you celebrate William of Orange defeating the Irish. It's one of the reasons there's an orange stripe on the Irish flag. The Irish Catholics aren't very fond of this holiday. Not at all. Uh, so the Orange men organized a march, just as they do in Dublin, or sorry, right. Belfast to this day. Right. Okay. And uh, during this march in 1870, there were Rights. Irish Catholics and Tammany Hall members who came out to beat up the people parading, and eight people were killed okay. in the violence. That's bad, but that's not exactly that's the New York really draft bad. riots. Uh, but 1871, the next year, same thing. They well, decide wait, wait, wait. No. they decide to have a parade, and Tammany Hall says, no, you won't. For the record, Tweed was not the mayor, but Tweed right. basically controlled the mayor, and he said, we're not going to do this. Tweed, by the way, was neither Irish nor Protestant. He was a uh, Scottish, I believe, descendant. Right. And, and but. But and he was Protestant, but he basically said, this is not a good idea. So Tammany Hall pushed through and basically everybody said, we are not going to have an Orange Day parade. And then the governor sent in the National Guard and said, you will have a parade. We are going to have armed National Guardsmen and 1,500 police guarding the parade route. And we're going to have this parade. And what could possibly go wrong? Everything. Because the Catholics attacked the Orange Marchers again, uh, and the police got involved, and the National Guard started shooting, and they ended up with 63 people dead. The New York and Society of St. Tammany. And 150 people 
Ah. Uh, 150. Okay, yes. Okay. So this is basically dead, the police open. This is a picture from the Times. Again, these are illustrators. The police did open fire on the crowd or the National Guard. Um, this was bad. Um, this was the undoing, really, at this moment of Boss Tweed. Because he had a clerk working in his office who was outraged about Tweed's response to this. I don't know if he was pro Northern Irish or what, but he basically took a group of financial documents and turned them over to the New York Times. Right. And then the New York Times wrote an expose because they had been anti Tammany Hall all along. They had been anti Tammany Hall. Well, he wasn't going to take it to the yeah. Irish Times. He took it to the. Next. Oh, okay, took. Okay, so go ahead. Um, and so uh, everyone's facing the fact that uh, something went wrong and everyone's blaming everybody else. Uh, and pointing the figure. And of course, the person they finally get is Boss, Boss Tweed. Tweed. They arrest him. They uh, take him to jail. They are going to try him, and he escapes. Actually, no, I, my recollection, he was convicted. He He's escaped convicted, afterwards. And he's, okay. He's convicted of corruption. He escapes afterwards. And he goes to Cuba. He goes to Cuba. <laughs> um but that's not far enough. He eventually makes it to Spain where a group of Spaniards <laughs> happened to have a copy of um, one of Thomas Nast's cartoons and they identify Boss Tweed from the Nast cartoon. They contact the authorities and they get him rearrested and brought back to New York. Where he spends the rest of his rest of his time in prison. Okay. Um, so what happens now is obviously, clearly, the Democratic Party is corrupt. Everybody agrees the Democratic Party is corrupt, and it's up to the Republicans to reform things because yes. the Republicans were pure as the driven snow. Hmm. Not That's what really. they thought. Something yeah. funny happened here, which is actually has nothing to do with New York City. But it has everything to do with what happened. What happens. Because the Republicans are not going to have clean hands. We're going to see credit mobilier. Oh, that's a pretty word. Yes. Everything's prettier in French. <laughs> um, the funding for the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, if you remember back to your civics class, credit mobilier uh, is going to use a whole bunch of very illegal scams in order to raise money. Their excuse was that there was not enough people investing if they just did it legally. So they, they did it kind of illegally. But unfortunately, there was a whole bunch of Republican uh, Republican officials all the way up to Ulysses Grant and uh, James Garfield, who was uh, Speaker of the House at the time, a whole bunch of Republican politicians were on the tape. Okay, so the net result is they were charged with building a section of the Transcontinental Railroad. Mm -hmm. It cost $50 million. It cost a huge amount of money, yeah. They charged the federal government $90 million. Right. This is, in my opinion, the biggest, at least, Inflation adjusted scandal in US government history. Right. It went all the way up to the, the vice president uh, was forced from uh, General Grant was pretty much denied another term. Right. Um, there's not, it's not clear that he was involved. He was such a war hero. I don't know if they wanted to taint him, right. taint him. But um, the vice president, I believe, went to jail. Skylar Colfax, he yeah, certainly Skyler Colfax got, went to jail. got yeah. driven off. Yeah. All of these people, and suddenly corruption is very much throughout the Republican Party, and right. they've got dirty hands. So it's not looking good for either party. And you've got the Southerners who are trying to fight against uh, um, Reconstruction and their problems with that. So... Uh, yeah. Yes. So it's, it starts to a get problem. a little interesting. It starts to get a little messy. And we're going to do something really, really mean, mm -hmm. which is we're going to have to say to be continued. Yep. Because, because what happens, so here's the stage is set. You've got Tammany Hall is filled with corruption beyond belief. Mm -hmm. You've got the Republican Party has been pushing reform. Yep. Um, reform, get rid of drinking, stop working on the Sabbath, 
freedom for slaves, right. get rid of Catholics. I was actually close to a Republican plank, yeah. although they didn't come out and say yeah. it. All of this, but suddenly the Republicans are caught with more money on their hands than Kameny Hall ever thought about stealing. Right. This was huge. This was very big. So suddenly, where's the reform going to go? Well, one thing that happened is Tammany had a rebirth. Um, yes, uh, Boss Tweed went to prison, but he was followed by John Kelly. Honest John, he was called. Honest John Kelly. Actually was an Irish Catholic. Right. Irish American. He was born here. But... Um, so you've got Tammany Hall actually had a regrowth of power after right. you would think the leader goes up the river, um, you know, everybody knows it's corrupt, it's time for cleanup, but things actually got worse right. for a period of time. And so and so we're going to see part two now, uh, Taming the Tiger, where we see the Republicans try reform movements that are somewhat successful. And the police set records for bribes, corruptions, and payoffs. All right, so th that's going to be next, when is that going to be? Next Wednesday. Next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific. Right. Well, you guys should be at work. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna be back, we're gonna continue this conversation, we're gonna try to wrap it up, and we're gonna try to lead to what I think this story leads to a very fascinating and clear con conclusion. Right. But the short version of it is, if you oppress people, they're going to resist. They're right. going to find a way to fight back. So we really want to thank you for being here, for watching our show, for making your comments. If you have any questions or if you want to make some comments, definitely go ahead and use our Twitter handle, H Unsettled, at H Unsettled. At H Unsettled. Uh, or uh, leave comments in the comment section. You should tell me when you're going to do that. I would have typed it up. Anyway, oh, so that's all for now. We will be back next week, which I believe is February the 6th, 7 p.m. Eastern, for Tammany the Terror, Taming the Tiger, Tammany Hall Part 2. I may even change the graphic. We'll see what happens. Good night, everybody. Thank good, you. Good night, stay, folks. Stay warm. Don't forget to write. <laughs>